Hi friends and welcome to my favorites and I decided to try something well a little bit different it's gonna be like a book club one of my favorite things is reading I don't always have time to um, read the books that I really want to read sometimes I just have to read things that uh, are necessary to get from point A to point B in planning and and doing things that um, are for you. So I had this great idea. I was just going to give you a, a book report on one of my favorite books, Tuesdays with Maury. It's so fantastic. It's by Mitch Album. He's written several books, but um, before I came to work. Uh, here and and really in in the senior field um, specifically I was the director of the Family Literacy Centers in Springville and I loved that I did that for 10 years it was really hard for me to let it go um, we helped thousands upon thousands of people increase their reading level over a 10-year span I grew one center um, to five and we were located within the library within an after-school program in the uh, elementary schools a couple of elementary schools actually were so wonderful about letting us have a room specifically for that and we were able to tutor children uh, utilizing the senior uh, companion program or the foster grandparent program which many of you have been a part of and let me tell you the teachers are so grateful for you but we were able to improve the reading level and and give one-on-one -on -one tutoring to anyone age 5 to 105 and during that time when school was closed we kept those rooms open and kept a summer reading program going and it was wonderful um, we also had a, uh, a location, a satellite, if you will, in the high school. And now, it wasn't just generally in the high school, but it was in a trailer where the students there were sequestered from all the other students. They were kind of the most troubled students in the school. They weren't allowed to, um, as, I guess, even have lunch with the other students. They had their lunch in their trailer. In a classroom of eight students, there were two teachers. And um, these students had some real difficult problems. I decided that um, even though I had wonderful volunteer tutors that um, were well-trained and did such a great job, I decided that the high school would be mine. I needed it to be uh, diligent and to let these kids know, these kids who soon would be on their own, that somebody really cared about them and really wanted to help improve their lives. Well, one of the projects, so I went in there every single morning, Monday through Friday, and worked one-on-one -on -one with each of the students, but we also, uh, once a week, had uh, an hour that we did a uh, class time together and the book I chose was Tuesdays with Maury. It, it, now you're wondering why would I choose this one? This is about a man who's dying but it's also about a man's life and I think we all go through life thinking that people die and that it will never be us. Regardless of if you're struck by lightning or you get some terrible virus or you live to be 104 and die from old age. It truly will happen. I mean, there's one person in, in the entire history that's ever conquered death and, um, and that's Jesus Christ. So, uh, anyways, I decided instead of just tell you about this book, I'm going to read it with you. So I, I guess this is Gina's reading corner, and I hope that you will tune in each Thursday and 
listen and and learn and if you want to follow along um, these books are very easy to come by you may already have a copy of it you could check it out on the um, from the library you know you can um, it, you can call and make an appointment to uh, head into the library they are they have specific senior hours give them a call uh, I also like to use Kindle I, I also like to use there's a product called Libby it's an app that you can use on your smart devices your tablet your phone that um, you can access books from your local library and it's free so I really like using that and and sometimes I'm able to read a book that I would normally not get because as you're scrolling through you get to see the books in a totally different manner so let's go ahead and get started with this okay the curriculum the last class of my old professor's life took place once a week in his house by a window in the study where he could watch a small hibiscus plant shed its pink leaves. The class met on Tuesdays. It began after breakfast. The subject was the meaning of life. It was taught from experience. No grades were given, but there were oral exams each week. You were expected to respond to questions and you were expected to pose questions of your own. You are also required to perform physical tasks now and then, such as lifting the professor's head to a comfortable spot on the pillow or placing his glasses on the bridge of his nose. Kissing him goodbye earned you extra credit. No books were required, yet many topics were covered, including love, work, community, family, aging, forgiveness, and finally death. The last lecture was brief, only a few words. A funeral was held in lieu of graduation. Although no final exam was given, you were expected to produce one long paper on what was learned. That paper is presented here. The last class of my old professor's life had only one student. I was the student. In the late spring of 1979, a hot, sticky Saturday afternoon, hundreds of Hundreds of us sit together side by side in rows of wooden folding chairs on the main campus lawn. We wear blue nylon robes. We listen impatiently to long speeches. When the ceremony is over, we throw our caps in the air and we are officially graduated from college, the senior class of Brandeis University in the city of Waltham, Massachusetts. For many of us, the curtain has just come down on childhood. Afterward, I find Maury Schwartz my favorite professor, and introduce him to my parents. He's a small man who takes small steps as if a strong wind could at any time whisk him up into the clouds. In his graduation day robe, he looks like a cross between a biblical prophet and a Christmas elf. He has sparkling green eyes, thinning silver hair that spills onto his forehead, big ears, a triangular nose, and tufts of graying eyebrows. Um... Although his teeth are crooked and his lower ones are slanted back as if someone had once punched them in, when he smiles, it's as if you'd just been told, as if you'd just told him the first joke on earth. He tells my parents how I took every class he taught. He tells them, you have a special bo boy here. Embarrassed, I look at my feet. Before we leave, I have my professor a present, a tan briefcase with his initials on the front. I bought this the day before at the shopping mall. I didn't want to forget him. Maybe I didn't want him to forget me. Mitch, you are one of the good ones, he says, admiring the briefcase, and then he hugs me. I feel his thin arms around my back. I'm taller than he is, and when he holds me, I feel awkward, older, as if I were the parent and he were the child. And he asks if I will stay in touch, and without hesitation, I say, of course. When he steps back, I see that he's crying. Have you ever had a situation like this where somebody in your life who has really inspired you in some way? This part made me think about my grandma and I remember holding her one day, hugging her and feeling that very same way that I had, I was feeling her body wither as she aged. I didn't want to believe it. Um, but I felt like this giant next to her. 
looking back, that's when Alzheimer's began um, for her, the suffering of that disease, which is what she eventually passed away from. And I was one of her caregivers. Um, but I totally related to that with Mitch. So here's the syllabus. His death sentence came in the summer of 1994. Looking back, Maury knew something bad was coming long before that. He knew it the day he gave up dancing. He had always been a dancer, my old professor. The music didn't matter. Rock and roll, big band, the blues, he loved them all. He would close his eyes and with a blissful smile begin to move to his own sense of rhythm. It wasn't always pretty, but then he didn't worry about a partner. Murray danced by himself. He used to go to this church in Harvard Square every Wednesday night for something called Dance Free. They had flashing lights and booming speakers and Maury would wander in among the mostly student crowd wearing a white t-shirt and black sweatpants and a towel around his neck. And whatever music was playing, that's the music to which he danced. He'd do the Lindy to Jimi Hendrix. He twisted and twirled. He waved his arms like a conductor on am amphetamines until sweat was dripping down the middle of his back. No one there knew he was a prominent doctor of sociology with years of experience of a, as a college professor and several well-respected books. They just thought he was some old nut. Once he brought a tango tape and taught them to, and got them to play it over the speakers, and then he commandeered the floor, shooting back and forth like some hot Latin lover. When he finished, everyone applauded. He could have stayed in that moment forever, but then the dancing stopped. He developed asthma in his 60s. His breathing became labored. One day he was walking along the Charles River and a cold burst of wind left him choking for air. He was rushed to the hospital and injected with adrenaline. A few years later, he began to have trouble walking. At a birthday party for a friend, he stumbled inexplicably. Another night, he fell down the stairs of a theater, startling a small crowd of people. Give him air, someone yelled. He was in his 70s by this point, so they whispered, old age. It helped him to his feet. But Maury, who was always more in touch with his insides than the rest of us, knew something else was wrong. This was more than old age. He was weary all the time. He had trouble sleeping. He dreamt he was dying. He began to see doctors, lots of them. They tested his blood, they tested his urine, they put a scope up his rear end and looked inside his intestines. Finally, when nothing could be found, one doctor ordered a muscle biopsy, taking a small piece out of Maury's calf. The lab report came back suggesting a neurological problem and Maury was brought in for yet another series of tests. In one of those tests, he sat in a special seat as they zapped him with electrical current, an electric chair of sorts, and studies it, studied his neurological responses. We need to check this further, the doctor said, looking over his results. Why, Maury asked, what is it? We're not sure, your times are slow. His times were slow, what did that mean? Finally, on a hot, humid day in August of 1994, Maury and his wife Charlotte went to the neurologist's office and he asked them to sit before he broke the news. Maury had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a brutal, unforgiving illness of the neurological system. There was no known cure. How did I get it? Maury asked. Nobody knew. Is it terminal? Yes. So I'm going to die. Yes, you are, the doctor said. I'm, I'm very sorry. He sat with Maury and Charlotte for nearly two hours, patiently answering their questions. When they left, the doctor gave them some information on ALS, little pamphlets, as if they were opening a bank account. Outside, the sun was shining and people were going about their business. A woman ran to put money in the parking meter. Another carried groceries. Charlotte had a million thoughts running through her mind. How much time do we have left? How will we manage? How will we pay the bills? My old professor, meanwhile, was stunned by the normalcy of the day around him. Shouldn't the world stop? Don't they know what has happened to me? But the world did not stop. It took no notice at all, and as Maury pulled weakly on the car door, he felt as if he were dropping into a hole. 
Now what, he thought. As my old professor searched for answers, the disease took him over day by day, week by week. He backed the car out of the garage one morning and could barely push the brakes. That was the end of the driving. He kept tripping, so he purchased a cane. That was the end of his walking free. He went for his regular swim at the YMCA, but found he could no longer undress himself. So he hired his first home care worker, a theology student named Tony, who helped him in and out of the pool and in and out of his bathing suit. In the locker room, the other swimmers pretended not to stare. They stared anyhow. That was the end of his privacy. In the fall of 1994, Maury came to the Hilly Brandeis campus to teach his final college course. He could have skipped this, of course. The university would have understood. I mean, why suffer in front of so many people? Stay at home. Get your affairs in order. But the idea of quitting did not occur to Maury. Instead, he hobbled into the classroom, his home for more than 30 years. Because of the cane, he took a while to reach the chair. Finally, he sat down, dropped his glasses off his nose, and looked out at the young faces who stared back in silence. My friends, I assume you're all here for the social psychology class. I've been teaching this course for 20 years, and this is the first time I can say there's a risk in taking it because I have a fatal illness. I may not live to finish this semester. If you feel this is a problem, I understand if you wish to drop the course. He smiled, and that was the end of his secret. ALS is like a lit candle. It melts your nerves and leaves your body a pile of wax. Often it begins with the legs and works its way up. You lose control of your thigh muscles so that you cannot support yourself standing. You lose control of your trunk muscles so that you cannot sit up straight. By the end, if you are still alive, you are breathing through a tube in the hole in your throat. While your soul, perfectly awake, is imprisoned inside a limp husk, perhaps able to blink or click, cluck a tongue like something from a science fiction movie. The man frozen inside his own flesh. This takes no more than five years from the day you contract the disease. Maury's doctors guessed he had two years left. Maury knew it was less. But my old professor had made a profound decision, one he began to construct the day he came out of the doctor's office with a sword hanging over his head. Do I wither up and disappear, or do I make the best of my time left? He asked himself. He would not wither. He would not be ashamed of dying. Instead, he would make death his final project, the center point of his days. Since everyone was going to die, he could be a great value, right? He could be research, a human textbook. Study me in my slow and patient demise. Watch what happens to me. Learn with me. Maury would walk that final bridge between life and death and narrate the trip. The fall semester passed quickly. The pills increased, therapy became a regular routine. Nurses came to his house to work with Maury's withering legs to keep the muscles active, bending them back and forth as if pumping water from a well. Massage specialists came by once a week to try to soothe the constant heavy stiffness he felt. He met with meditation teachers and closed his eyes and narrowed his thoughts until his world shrunk down to a single breath, in and out, in and out. One day, using his cane, he stepped onto the curb and fell over into the street. The cane was exchanged for a walker. As his body weakened, the back and forth to the bathroom became too exhausting, so Maury began to urinate into a large beaker. He had to support himself as he did this, meaning someone had to hold the beaker while Maury filled it. Most of us would be embarrassed by all this, especially at Maury's age, but Maury was not like most of us. When some of his close colleagues would visit, he would say to them, listen, I have to pee. Would you mind helping? Are you okay with that? Often, to their own surprise, they were. In fact, he entertained a growing stream of visitors. He had discussion groups about dying, what it really meant, how societies had always been afraid of it without necessarily understanding it. He told his friends that if they really wanted to help him, they would treat him not with sympathy, but with visits, phone calls, a sharing of their problems the way they had always shared their problems because Maury had always been a wonderful listener. 
For all that was happening to him, his voice was strong and inviting, and his mind was vibrating with a million thoughts. He was intent on proving that the word dying was not synonymous with useless. The new year came and went, although he never said it to anyone. Maury knew this would be the last year of his life. He was using a wheelchair now, and he was fighting time to say all the things he wanted to say to all the people he loved. When a colleague at Brandy's died suddenly of a heart attack, Maury went to his funeral. He came home depressed. What a waste, he said. All those people saying all those wonderful things and Irv never got to hear any of it. Maury had a better idea. He made some calls. He chose a date and on a cold Sunday afternoon, he was joined in his home by a small group of friends and family for a living funeral. Each of them spoke and paid tribute to my old professor. Some cried, some laughed. One woman read a poem. My dear and loving cousin, your ageless heart, as you move through time, layer on layer, tender sequoia. Maury cried and laughed with them, and all the heartfelt things we never get to say to those we love, Maury said that day. His living funeral was a rousing success. Only Maury wasn't dead yet. In fact, the most unusual part of his life was about to unfold. We're going to stop there for today, but I want to share with you that as I um, read this book with the group of high school students, I had this idea about having a living funeral for each of them. And so what I... As time went on and we went through this book, one of the projects we did is I had them write down something that if they had were never going to see the people in their classroom again, and they knew this was the last time, what would they want them to know? What would they wish they would have said to them? And I asked them to write it down. And I asked them to do that for every single person in the classroom. And I gathered those papers up. I let them work on that for the week. Throughout the time of reading this book, I'll share the different things that we did and how it turned out. But I'm going to encourage you to start thinking about the people in your life. If you, I mean... In a way, Maury had a gift, a gift of time, and knowing that his time was limited. And isn't all of our time limited? Are we utilizing that time to share with one another the things truly from our hearts? Or are we getting angry and frustrated with someone and sharing those things instead? I've, I've heard this phrase that it's much nicer to share a piece of your heart than a piece of your mind. So I'm going to encourage you this week to think about some things that people, especially that you would like to share some things with, um, write them down. It doesn't help anyone if they're just in your mind. So I'm going to encourage you to get a notebook Write down the people in your life that you want them to know something and start writing those things. Maybe it's a, a page per person and start writing the things you truly want them to know. And it's something you'll continue working on. Hopefully you'll take some time to share those things with them, whether it's through a phone call or a text or even sending them, them the paper that uh, you're making. Um, that's our project for the week. I hope you'll join me next week for my little book nook. And we'll continue with Tuesdays with Maury. And thank you for joining me. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. And I, I'd, I would also love book um, ideas. I've got tons of books that I love. Um, but let me know what you think about this. I hope you have a great day.